Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons entitled The Book of Acts. Now, we have done a couple lessons already. This is lesson number three in that series. And we're, of course, following along the story chronologically. This is the lesson for July 21 of 2018. And so it's entitled Life in the Early Church. And this will cover events what happened shortly after Pentecost. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we wish we could have been there to see these events which we are studying here, but we look forward to the time when something similar might happen again as we approach the end of this world. Forgive us where we have delayed the coming. We believe that the time can't be much longer the world is in such a mess. May we be a part of that final message is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Life in the early church. What was it like? This lesson is going to focus on approximately the first year after Pentecost. So you can sort of adjust your thinking to that. And what do we know? Well, we know that the church was growing at lightning speed. I mean, 3,000 people joined the church at Pentecost. Have you ever wondered how they got all those people baptized and how they went about that? But anyway, pretty soon there were 5,000, as we will see. But there was a, a bit of a problem in those early Christians because they still felt that they were fully Jews, but they were still Christ they were Christians. And so they struggled in their minds about where their loyalties were. Um, and so they would go to the temple and participate in some of the ceremonies. But then when it came time to talk about their Christian things, they didn't dare do that, so they would meet in private homes. But obviously they couldn't all 5,000 of them meet in any home by any stretch of the imagination. So it's hard to know. There must have been people meeting here and there and there and there and there in all kinds of places. Yes, Gordon. If they didn't speak about their Christian values, Christian ideas, other than in private homes, how is it going to spread? Obviously, well, that's obviously uh, Peter and the uh, disciples, apostles, spoke publicly yep. about the Christian values. Mm -hmm. So we're going to speak very specifically about some of those events, but obviously not every one of the 5,000 people who were Christians would have an opportunity to stand up in the temple and preach. So were they all ministering to their neighbors? Were they inviting people into their own homes? We just don't know. Well, there's an interesting passage that throws some light on this time, found in Acts 2, verses 46 and 47. Day after day they met as a group in the temple, and they had their meals together in their homes. So here they are going back and forth eating with glad and humble hearts, praising God, and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Now, why? what do you think that implies? And every day the Lord had added to their group those who were being saved. Enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Did that include the priests and the Pharisees? Well, some of them, because they <laughs> ended up being uh, converting. converted yeah. later. Well, Jesus had promised, think about the ex experience. That Jesus had promised that he would send the Holy Spirit down. Did they have proof that the Holy Spirit had come? Well, yes. Yeah. yeah, Pentecost, right? Yes. And they were, we're going to read in a little bit, that they were laying hands on people and giving them the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit had come down. He had also said that he would be coming back soon. So they thought, and God said, Okay, Jesus had said, you know, you're going to go to speak to all, all the world. And they, they thought about Pentecost. And here were people from all over the world had come in, heard the messages right there in Jerusalem. They thought, well, we don't need to go out to the world. The world will just come to us. By the way, uh, some of you are aware that that's what Adventists thought in the early days of their preaching. We don't need to go around the world. The whole world is immigrating to the United States. We'll just, we'll just convert all the people here. Wasn't that uh, God's stated intentional plan was that the whole world would come to Jerusalem? Back in the see? Old Testament. 
Yeah. I guess that wasn't God's original plan, but uh, that was a plan well, before well, Jesus came. Yeah. Well, maybe perhaps the borders would expand uh, yeah, as sure. people were converted. What I like about the passage you just read is uh, in verse 47, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Yeah. It's a progressive case. It's not being saved, done. It's something that has to continue through life. Yeah. Well, as a result of that, as we know what was happening, people said, we're, we're going to see Jesus come in the clouds any day now. You know, if, if we need to buy more food to feed everybody, let's just sell our property. We'll give the money to the group. And it was a community kind of a situation. So you wonder, will that time ever come again in the 21st century when Christians will be willing to share everything they have because they believe Jesus will be here at any moment? Well. It's kind of that way in 1844. Yeah, a little bit like that. Uh, following the Pentecost experience, Luke shifted his focus in his description of the book in the book of Acts to four things: the teachings of the apostles, their fellowshipping together, the breaking of bread or sharing their meals, and prayers. You read about that in Acts two, verse forty-two. Wouldn't you like to have been a part of that? Wouldn't I'm looking forward to the day when we'll see all this in 3D living color in the sky when. When God portrays the panorama, I'm just really excited about that possibility. Well, as we know, there was a large courtyard surrounding the temple in the days of Jesus. There was out there, and Herod had spent a lot of money, a lot of effort, to ex actually extend the ground, so he could put us, so he could make it a much larger area. So the the courtyard area of Herod's temple was much larger than the courtyard of Solomon's temple. And surrounding it were pillared areas all the way around, which came to be known as Solomon's Porches. And so the, the Christians, okay, let's all come together at the temple. We'll meet in Solomon's Porches, and if somebody wants to join us, and that's what happened. Thousands of people. And what kind of things do you suppose were attracting all those people? Well, Besides the good news. Well, perhaps the continuation of tongues, yes. people coming from other locations and, and hearing somebody speaking in my language over here. Okay, and, What's and going on? What else? Healings. The healing. Yeah. Yes. yeah, certainly the healing was a, was a major attraction. Think about the experience of Jesus. Yeah, people came from countries around uh, to be able to get to Jesus. Um, and what did they talk about, do you think? Think about if you were one of the disciples and here were all these people waiting to hear what you had to say, what would you talk about? Your experience with Jesus. That would certainly have to be a major part of it, talking about what Jesus did, your experiences with Jesus, etc. Anything else you would talk about? Well, you'd be studying the prophecies sure. relating to Jesus uh, coming and what had to take place. and such, much as Jesus did on the road to Emmaus with yeah. the disciples. And, and I mean that, to a, a person with a Jewish background, that was compelling evidence. I mean, here we have all the Old Testament and lots of places talking about the Messiah coming and, okay, here, and, and, and I, I'm sure they were, they became experts at showing how, here's the text in the Old Testament and here's the fulfillment in the life of Jesus. I mean, that's, if you're looking for the Messiah to come, that's pretty compelling stuff. But perhaps one more greater thing is yet. What did the Messiah come to accomplish? That wasn't quite what they expected. No. <laughs> they had to struggle with that one. Well, they also shared their meals together, celebrating the Lord's Supper, celebrating just common meals. They rapidly developed the idea that we're a family. I mean, how many churches today have the feeling that we're a family. Well, it's a lot easier when your church is maybe 50 or 60 or 70 people and not 7,000, but uh, <coughs> that's a great, great experience. Um, so, do you think they still went to the synagogues? Mm -hmm. Think they were welcome in the synagogues? Sometimes. 
Yeah, it was sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has been estimated, and I don't know how the, anybody estimates this, but it, it has been estimated by the time we get to the stoning of Stephen that there were something like 20,000 Christians in, in and around Jerusalem. And there were, in a separate estimate that had nothing to do with that one, someone has estimated that there were at least 200 synagogues in and around Jerusalem. So it wasn't just at the temple. Remember, the temple was a place for you to bring your lambs, to be sacrificed, etc. And, of course, an opportunity for you to come and offer, I mean, to, well, to offer free will offerings and to gather as they did in Solomon's porches. But it wasn't really a place for meeting, to have meetings of any kind. So there were these synagogues all over the place, and we're going to read about some of those synagogues um, coming up. But a lot of it happened, in terms of the Christians, a lot of that happened in private homes. And so the words that describe what was going on are found in Acts chapter 2, uh, 44 and 45. I'll read that. All the believers continued together in close fellowship and shared their belongings with one another. They would sell their property and possessions and distribute the money among all according to what each one needed. And then if you look at chapter 4, verses 34 and 35, there was no one in the group who was in need. Those who owned fields or houses would sell them and bring the money received from the sale and hand it over to the apostles and the money was distributed to each one according to his need. And it gives the example of Barnabas, um, who was very generous with selling some property and bringing the money. Um, so then we, the next big event is what we read about in Acts chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 26. We won't read that whole thing, but you remember the story. One day, Peter and John went to the temple at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the hour for prayer. There at the beautiful gate, as it was called, a man, was a man who had been lame all his life. Every day he was carried to the gate to beg for money from the people who were going into the temple. And I wish we had a picture of the model of the second temple period uh, that's, in, that's in Jerusalem today so we could show you where the beautiful gate is, but we don't. When he saw Peter and John going in, he begged them to give him something. They looked straight at him, and Peter said, look at us. So he looked at them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said to him, I have no money at all. And you wonder, at that <laughs> point, did his hopes just collapse? But I give you what I have, and the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I order you to get up and walk. And he took him by his right hand and helped him up. At once a man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and started walking around. Then he went into the temple with them, walking and jumping and praising God. Can you, can you, I mean, you can imagine the experience. I mean, there's probably thousands of people in there, you know, purchasing animals, selling the animals, you know, they, they had turned the outer courts there into a, into a marketplace, but, and here's this guy jumping and shouting and praising God, I mean, you can imagine <laughs> what got in him. That's the guy that used to be standing, used to be lame by the gate. How, did, how, how does he walk, you know? You could just see that the, I could just picture the, the excitement just spread across the whole temple area. Well, then he went into the temple and walking and jumping, and people there saw him and, and praising God. They were praising God. And when they recognized him as the beggar who had sat at the beautiful gate, they were all surprised and amazed at what had happened. As the man held on to Peter and John in Solomon's porch, as it was called, the people were amazed and ran to them. When Peter saw the people, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why are you surprised at this? Why do you stare at us? Do you think that it was by means of our own power or God in us that we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has given divine glory to his servant Jesus. And of course, this is a perfect intro to another sermon, right? And he talks about how you handed him over to the to the Gentiles and so forth like that. and um, He was holy and so forth. He talks about Jesus. And now, my fellow Israelites, I know that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was due to your ignorance. Um, but God announced long ago through all the prophets that his Messiah had to suffer and he made it come true in this way. Repent then and turn to God so that he will forgive your sins. If you do, times of spiritual strength will come from the Lord and he will send Jesus, who is the Messiah. He is already chosen for you. He will, must remain. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for all things to be made new. 
and, and so forth. So that was the preamble to the whole thing. And what happened next? Well, the guess, showed up. guess who wasn't too happy? Yeah. <laughs> the hierarchy. The hierarchy showed up. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were hoping that the Christian movement would gradually die. What's with this now? They're spreading <laughs> all this stuff around. Then suddenly, before hundreds and maybe thousands of people, the disciples were performing miracles just as Jesus had done. And I wonder, how would you feel if you were one of the Pharisees and a disciple comes along, a, a nobody by their standards, never having had any education of forth, and he touches somebody and makes them well? I mean, how do you, how do you respond to something like that? No, it didn't happen. Oh well, yeah, there, there's a guy. There's a guy standing there, right? You can't. What can you? Well, how can you argue against that? How could they not recognize though that that was a gift from God? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it had to be. I mean, how could you? What else could you say? What do What do we say at so-called healings today? Yeah. Well. I don't know how much of the story we need to read, but it's an incredible story. Jumping down to verse 13, the God of Abraham, Mezzing, Jacob, the God of our ancestors has given divine glory to his servant Jesus. And what do you think the priests and the Pharisees had to say about that? Well, of course, Peter and John were arrested. And they were told and brought before the council and told absolutely under no circumstances are you to say any more about this Jesus guy. Yeah, they wanted to make to the people to believe that he was dead, mm -hmm. and here he is showing up alive and healing people again. Yeah. Well, look at chapter four, starting with verse eight. I I love this. Um, I, I I you know you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't gloat when your enemies are, de <laughs> are defeated. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, answered them to the leaders, leaders of the people, knows. If we are being questioned today about the good deed done to the lame man, by the way, he was standing right there, and how he was healed, then you should all know, and all the people of Israel should know, that this man stands here before you completely well through the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I can just see the Pharisees, oh, no, no. Thought we got rid of him. Why, why does he have to mention him? whom you crucified and whom God raised from death. Oh, no. Jesus is the one whom the scripture says, of whom the scripture says, a stone that you builders despised turned out to be the most important of all. Salvation is to be found to him alone in all the world. There is no one else whom God has given who can save us. The members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of no education. And then this next sentence is what I just love. They realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. What a story. What a story. And I'm sure they thought, some of them must have known that Peter had denied Jesus just a few weeks before. You know, the woman said, but I, you look like one of, just, don't you speak that language from Galilee? Oh, no, cursing and swearing. No, I don't know anything about that. And here's now, he's pointing his finger and says, you. So, in that sermon, Peter focused on five things that became a sort of theme for the disciples. One, Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah for whom they had been waiting for so long, Acts 3.18. Two, God resurrected him from the grave, Acts 3.15. Jesus was later taken up to heaven, Acts 3.13. Four, but he had promised to come again, Acts 3.20. And five, if you want to be one of his followers, you must repent and ask for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 3.19. So what about that? Would Peter's sermon be appropriate in our day? Every day. Every day. For the rest of eternity, from fact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, Peter was talking to people who are well-versed in Scripture. Uh, it's very likely that there were people in, in Jesus' day who had memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. 
Think about that. Memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. There's some Jews, very conservative, very studious Jews today that memorize two or three books of the Old Testament I know of personally. I mean, in Hebrew. Well, so when Peter and John spoke to them, these are people who were well-versed in Scripture already. What kind of people do we face in our day? People who don't know anything about Scripture. I watch some quiz programs on TV every once in a while because that happen, comes on just about the time I'm eating my, my dinner in the evening. And um, it just amazes me. People on those quiz programs, they know every ridiculous character and every ridiculous movie and every person on every TV program that you ever heard of and all kinds of nonsense. But as soon as they come to Bible questions, mm -hmm. all three of them standing like, what's that? Okay. Well, what should we do? Should we modify our message? Well, how should, how we should, should we modify our message to make it appropriate to the audience? And Carrie, I think you have something on that? Yes. Of all professing Christians, Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Christ before the world. The proclamation of the third angel's message calls for the presentation of the Sabbath truth. This truth, with others included in the message, is to be proclaimed. But the great center of attraction, Christ Jesus, must not be left out. It is at the cross of Christ that mercy and truth meet together, and righteousness and peace kiss each other. The sinner must be led to look to Calvary with the simple faith of a little child. He must trust in the merits of the Savior, accepting his righteousness, believing in his mercy. It comes from Gospel Workers, page 156, paragraph 2 through 157. Well, there was one particular group of people who were really upset by what was being said and done. And who was that? Sadducees. Sadducees. Why were they so upset? They didn't believe in the, the full Old Testament, just the books of Moses, and they didn't believe in, in life after death. They didn't believe, once you're dead, you're dead. No chance for anybody to come back to life. And what else didn't they believe in? Angels? Yeah. So what do you do when there's people here proclaiming someone is being raised from the dead and you don't believe anybody can be raised from the dead? Their most cherished teachings were being directly challenged. Um, imagine Peter giving that sermon there with the man who had been healed standing beside him. I mean, talk about Exhibit A. <laughs> you know, there it is. Well, the disciples was put out of the room while the the team reviewed what they had to so say, what the Sanhedrin reviewed what they had to say. And then they were called back and they were told what? Don't do it again. Do not talk any more about this Jesus. And what did Peter say, Fred? Yes, in Acts 4, 19, 20 from uh, the Good News Bible. But Peter and John answered them, You yourselves judge which is right in God's sight, to obey you or to obey God. For we cannot stop speaking of what we ourselves have seen and heard. I mean, what can any of us speak about? We can only speak about the things that we have seen and heard, right? Mm -hmm. Honestly. Well, what do you suppose happened when, I mean, here, Peter and John were the leaders probably of the group in, in, in Jerusalem at that time, and they were arrested by the Sanhedrin. What do you suppose the rest of the Christians were doing? Praying. Praying. They, they knew there was a very distinct possibility that these guys would be killed or tortured or who knows what. But lo and behold, all of a sudden, Peter and John are there. And there must have been incredible rejoicing and celebrating. These guys are, got free. And what happened? Angel. We don't usually emphasize this, but the Holy Spirit came down on them again. And they were filled with 
to and began to proclaim God's messages with boldness. So, what do you do now with five thousand Christians in the midst of a, a city that probably held two hundred thousand in in the in the in between times, and then up to two million at the time of, of Passover and Pentecost and Feast of Tabernacles, so forth like that. 5,000 of you, what are you going to do? Think all of them were out spreading the gospel? Well, we know about the story of Barnabas, who, was, who gave, sold some property, and he was ready, he just handed the money over to the disciples. Said, here, it needs, to be, it needs to be used to help everybody, to sustain them, and so forth. Do you think there were any people who joined the church just because they might be fed by doing that? Yes. What do we call people like that in our day? Rice, Rice Christians. Rice Christians, yeah. Well, we should mention that before Peter and John were released on that occasion, the, the, uh, the authorities, the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, tried to once again say, look, we're in charge here. We're the ones who have the authority. We're the ones who have the right to tell you who, who can preach and who can't preach. Who do you think you are? Well, it, they didn't seem to phase these Galilean fishermen who just kept right on preaching. They, they'd taken the city by storm. Well, unfortunately, you know that when God is having wonderful success and the gospel is spreading like something, Satan's going to have to do something to try to disrupt things, right? And so we have the story of Ananias and Sapphira found in Acts 5. There was a man named Ananias, I'm reading from Acts 5, who was with his wife Sapphira, sold some property, <coughs> excuse me, sold some property that belonged to them. <coughs> but with his wife's agreement, he kept part of the money for himself and handed the rest over to the apostles. Peter said to him, Ananias, why did you let Satan take control of you and make you lie to the Holy Spirit by keeping part of the money received for the property? Before you sold the property, it belonged to you, and after you sold it, the money was yours. Why then did you decide to do such a thing? You have not lied to human beings. You have lied to God. And what happened? Died. Fell down and died. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> <clears throat> that wasn't a good idea, was it? <coughs> and all who heard it were terrified. The <coughs> I'm sorry. The young man came in, wrapped up his body, and carried it out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife, not knowing what had happened, came in. Peter asked her, Tell me, was this the full amount you and your husband received from your, for your property? Now, we don't have the rest of the story. Apparently, they had come in and said earlier, we're going to sell this property and we're going to give all the money to the group. Apparently they didn't. Yes, she said, the full amount. So Peter said to her, why did you and your husband decide to put the Lord's Spirit to the test? The men who buried your husband are now at the door and they will carry you out too. At once she fell down at his feet and died. The young men came in, saw that she was dead, so they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. The whole church and all the others who heard of this were terrified. Uh, I think God has a hand in doing all of that. No. God doesn't do that kind of stuff, right? God is not a killer. He's the creator. So did these people have um, serendipitous heart attacks or what happened? I went to a scientific meeting once where a Jewish scholar, well, he, he was a physician and a, a Jew, and he said, this is an example of the um, of heart turning to stone. That, <laughs> of okay. A sudden terr terrifying thing happening to someone, and you know, their heart just uh, stops, and it literally calcifies, he said. Hmm. I see. And how common is that? He gave the other examples of voodoo deaths. Uh -huh. 
So he was saying he was saying that this is you know this is the example in the Bible. Of course, he didn't believe in the Bible. Well, in my opinion, to say that um, someone just dies serendipitously of a heart attack at the right moment, as some have claimed, is too preposterous to believe. So why didn't God just overlook Ananias and Sapphira's actions? I mean, couldn't he forgive them? This is not a terrible sin, right? It wasn't the issue of being forgiven or not, though. Everybody is forgiven. Mm -hmm. I mean, God is not in the vengeance business or retribution business. Uh, but Ananias and Sapphira were examples to a whole community. Mm -hmm. And they had publicly said that they would give all their money uh, that they got from this property. I mean, you can't just say, oh, well. Yeah. Well, and you know that if God had just forgiven them, how long would it take before people, somebody would start figuring out, oh, they kept some of that money back? Yeah. Somebody's pointed out that at the beginning of <clears throat> the, the Church of the Wilderness, there was a similar incident where... Yes. Aiken. Uh, right. Where, well, that, and, and oh. I think there was something with the sanctuary. I forget. Was it Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? Oh, yeah. Or oh, yes. yeah. Where uh, at the beginning of that epic, and then at the beginning of the church ep epic, these things happened. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in my opinion, God has sometimes has to step in and do things which he doesn't want to do uh, because it's... He, he needs to preserve the community. And in the Song of Moses, it, it does say that, uh, I'm trying to find it here, I just lost it, but it says, I'm the Lord, I kill. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, whether he out and out kills or he steps back and said, well, well what's God's our protector. He, 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 the Satan goes around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. We wrestle not against flesh and well, blood, and so forth. What what Gordon was saying about his Jewish doctor friend, I mean, you know, we've heard the stories about being scared to death, mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. If you were presented with, I mean, if I had done something like that, and I came in before the higher powers, and Peter is telling me what had just happened with my husband, and I'm now realizing God knows. Mm -hmm. It's not Peter that's talking, it's God that's talking. Yeah. My heart might have a few... Yeah. Palpitations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In any <laughs> case, lying to God isn't a good idea. No. <laughs> well, they use that, use that example as uh, people that make a pledge, and then they don't follow through on their pledge. Yeah. You know? It, it's, uh, it, it, use, people use it to keep people in line. Yeah. huh? certainly underlines the gravity of sin. No matter how we consider the person who might have killed them, I prefer to think it's the angel of the devil, not God himself. But the, the text doesn't say that God yet did no, it. No. It's, you, you can read into it anything you want. Right. Yeah. We'll find that out later. Yeah. We'll find out. Do we Seriousness need to of sin is what it's all about. In other words, the, yeah. the text <coughs> here in Deuteronomy says, it is I who put to death and give life. I ha have wounded, and it is I who heal. So is that Isaiah forty-five seven? No, that's Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy okay. thirty-two, okay. Uh, thirty-nine. So, well, um, going on with the story, many miracles. I'm look. I'm reading Acts five, starting with verse twelve. Many miracles and wonders were being performed among the people by the apostles. All the believers met together in Solomon's porch. Nobody outside the group dared to join them, even though the people spoke highly of them. But more and more people were added to the group, a crowd of men and women who believed in the Lord. I mean, imagine the, the frustration of the Pharisees and the, and, the, and the Sadducees, because now it's not just Jesus they have to keep track of. There's a whole bunch of people performing miracles. Yes. So what does it mean, nobody outside the group dared join them? Yeah. What does that mean? I think it's talking about nobody tried to stand up and preach their message. They were the preachers, but people were joining the group. Yeah, I, that, that's the only way I can understand that. Well, there... Uh, I'm, sure that the, I'm sure the Pharisees and the Sadducees would have been happy to stand up and contradict what their disciples were saying. But God didn't allow that. 
it almost sounds like it's no one from outside the believers came to listen to them. But yeah. I, no. I know that isn't what it Clearly, means well, because of, of, of the context. What happened? Yeah. Mes the message says it just a little different, but it's basically the same. It says, but even though people admired them a lot, outsiders were wary of joining them. I see. Well, as a result of what the apostles were doing, sick people were carried out into the streets and placed on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Were any people healed by Peter's shadow? We don't have record of in our Bibles, but maybe it's in one of those of pages it's missing. Well, it, uh, it depends on if it if the whole thought is carried through the end of 16 and they were all being healed, it says. Mm -hmm. uh, bringing people who were sick and afflicted with unclean spirits and they were all being healed. So um, it doesn't, I mean, you could argue, argue mm -hmm. it either way. Well, yeah. didn't even the woman touching Jesus' yeah. cloak do yeah. the same thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, of course, what do you do when people are just being healed by the hundreds and the disciples, are, the, the, the work is just, you arrest Peter and John, put them in prison. We've got to stop this, right? They still so, haven't figured out who they were dealing with. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. And so what happened? They were arrested and put in prison in the middle of the night somewhere. An angel comes along and un un leases, undoes the shackles and opens the gates and sends them out and says, go over to the temple and start preaching. So at dawn, what's happening? The Sanhedrin's gathering together. They're getting ready to bring Peter and John out of prison and to trial. And they send someone to the jail. And <laughs> what do they find out? <laughs> There's nobody there. Still locked and nobody there. And the guards are still there. And then somebody comes in. Oh, those people you're looking for, they're over, <laughs> they're over there preaching in the temple. I mean... You know, I, I, like again, I, sh I shouldn't smile or laugh when people are, are really having a bad time, but these people, they must have been just incredibly frustrated. When the high priest and the council met together, they called for the disciples to be brought from prison only to discover that they were gone. And in fact, they were preaching in the temple courtyard. Notice the words of the high priest. Dwayne, I think that's yours. Yes. Acts 5.28, we gave you strict orders not to teach in the name of this man, he said, but see what you've done? You spread your teaching all over Jerusalem, and you want to make us responsible for his death. That's from the Good News Bible. Oh dear, make us responsible for his death? How could you do that? <laughs> well, instead of withering and fading under these accusing words, notice what Peter and the other apostles said, recorded in Acts 5.29-32. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God, not men. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from death after you had killed him by kneeling him to a cross. God raised him to his right hand side as leader and savior to give the people of Israel the opportunity to repent and have their sins forgiven. We are witness to these things. We and the Holy Spirit is God's gift to those who obey him. Does it sound like they're backing down? Anything but, right? They're getting bolder by the minute, aren't they? Well, the members of the council became furious. Well, fortunately, there was one person that had a little bit cooler head. His name was Gamaliel. What do we know about Gamaliel? He was a teacher of the law. Which He was a teacher of the law, and if you know the original languages, he was addressed by the very highest term. Not just a teacher, but a if you will, a, a father of the teacher, something like that. He was recognized as being superior in his teaching. What else do we know about Gamaliel? Coming Paul, up? Was, Paul was one of his disciples. Paul ended up being one of his disciples, didn't he? Very good. So what did he tell the people? What did Gamaliel say? You know, there have been other people in the past who have let, risen up with, got groups to follow them, and when, they, when their leaders were killed or destroyed, the groups faded away. Let's not get excited. Just relax. You know, we could find ourselves fighting against God. What an insight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so what... I wonder if 
Paul eventually converted him, maybe. Yeah. I don't know how long he lived after this. Maybe he maybe he was at the end of his life at this time. So I guess we can probably figure out by now that there were just an enormous number of marvelous things going on in the early church. We just have just a sampling of some of the most startling things that happened. That's all we have to just get a just a taste of, of what was going on. Um, so what are we supposed to learn from all of that, Gordon? From Testimonies to the Church, Volume 8, and Review and Herald from July 7, 1910, we are stewards entrusted by our absent Lord with the care of his household and his interests, which he came to this world to serve. He has returned to heaven, leaving us in charge, and he expects us to watch and wait for his appearing. Let us be faithful to our Lord, lest coming suddenly we f he find us sleeping. And Myra, I think you have another one to add to that. Yes. The people need to be impressed with the sacredness of their vows and the pledges to the cause of God. Such pledges are not generally held to be obligatory as a promissory note from man to man, but as a promise less sacred but is a promise less sacred and binding because it is made with God? Because it lacks some technical terms and cannot be enforced by law, will the Christian disregard the obligation to which he has given his word? No legal note or bond is more obligatory than a pledge made to the cause of God. From and of course, Bible that's Commentary, Volume 6, page... 1056. 1056. Yeah. 10, yeah it's, that's reflecting back on what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. Well, it should be clear from these few stories that Jesus left his disciples with the blessing of the Holy Spirit and with a commission to carry the message to the world. Does that challenge still apply to us? Absolutely. Is God still waiting for that to happen? <clears throat> well, you've probably all heard this quote, but I will repeat it. We should be ready, be ready as if Jesus would come today, but continue working in the mission of the church as if he would take another hundred years to come. And that's, of course, quoted from our Bible study guide for Friday, July 20. So do we make the life, death, and resurrection and soon, coming of, soon return of Jesus central to our thinking and our speaking to those around us? I have um, a very interesting sort of Thing happening at my work these days. There's a young lady, well, I, I work with a, young, a, a number of young women who are medical assistants and LVNs and so forth like that, helping to take care of patients. And you, you, you're never quite sure when you talk to people like that. You know, you, you don't, in, it's a sort of a government funded facility, so you don't sort of just, okay, come together, we're going to when you talk about the gospel, you sort of mention it one, and you're never quite sure who's going to respond. And I have one young lady right now that's just enamored with some Bible lessons I have given her to look at. They're, they're actually DVDs and Bible lessons on DVD that she can look at, and then she comes back, well, tell me more. Aren't there some questions, some guidance? Where? And I gave her a Bible, and oh, she was so excited. And you just don't know. I mean, how many people out there are walking the streets who would just be delighted if we could touch their lives in some way or another? So, what about it? Do you know a Peter or a John or a Barnabas or an Ananias and Sapphira? Are there any Gamaliels among us? Who were all those people who b were baptized very soon after Pentecost? Why do so many people respond so quickly? Outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Sure, and there's another factor that I think we shouldn't forget. Jesus had taught in that area for three and a half years. Well, around the whole yeah. area. They, they'd heard him. So, many of them had heard him and uh, the f seed had been planted, yeah. watered, and now it finally bore fruit. Yes, I'm sure that m probably everyone, or close to everyone, that, 
that responded on Pentecost that day was someone who had seen or heard or something that Jesus had done and probably was thinking about it in their minds and here this event happened and they said, yep, that's, that's what we needed to see, that's what we needed to know. So what do you think convinced them to become Christians in face of the opposition of the Jewish leaders? What kind of things would, would cause you to say, okay, I'm going to change sides in this war? Who can argue with truth? Yeah, that's true. It's an important point, I think, because uh, the message as it was taught by the Jews at that time was not a message of love and no. compassion. Priest had Jesus, a, go ahead. The priests had a money machine going there, and their life was being interfered with, and the general populace knew they could see these priests getting around in all their wealth, and what Peter and John and the others were doing was getting to the whole countryside. And big difference. I, I mean, and think think about what we've just been talking about. Here's a group that are so excited about what they're hearing, they're they're looking for every opportunity to get together and talk. And when they when you come, that you're welcomed, you're hugged, you're you're said you're a part of the family. Do you think they were hugged by the scribes and the Pharisees? Mm -mm. No way. No way. <laughs> they're, they're, Give us money, you know. Yes. I mean, just think about the the two different sides here. I think it's pretty obvious why people flocked. Yes. I mean, look at this completely different approach. And also Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Mm -hmm. And certainly that's uh, the sense of the cross. And of course, the believers afterwards who preached that he had been lifted up and died and, mm -hmm. and then resurrected. So uh, that there's that drawing. It's not just a mental gymnastic I, I, thing. There, yeah. I think there's a spiritual element there that... Uh, Drawing people. I think John twelve thirty two, and it really doesn't say men. It says all. Yeah. yeah. Which is uh, which all the universe yeah. draw yeah. all intelligent creatures yeah. to to God. That's a state into a state of harmony, a state of atonement, which God has always done and will apparently will continue to do for eternity. And there's another factor that I think we need to put into the hatch here. Um, here's someone who knows how to raise people from the dead. Yeah. And to heal all kinds of every, I mean, your leprosy can be healed. Your demon possession can be healed. I mean, we have not seen anything like this. We have never, I mean, they had never seen anything like this before. Not, it was not a replay of something that happened before. It, no. was, it was, in which, and by, like Fred mentioned, truth. You know, people, some people can sort out truth in spite of the milieu, or so to yeah. speak, of, and would take the book of Job. A good portion of those, majority of what was said in the book of Job was not truth. Mm -hmm. And yet at the end, God says, you didn't tell the truth. And most people go through that book and they don't understand what the, what the message is of the book of Job yeah. to this day. Yeah. And they can have their degrees and, and uh, still don't tell you. Well, in terms of bringing people into the church, you could guess that a lot of money has been spent by researchers to try to figure out because a lot of people end up coming to the church and then pretty soon they drift away again how what what factors cause uh, someone to join the church and stay personal getting, contact yeah personal yeah. contact and getting involved okay there are three things that have been that have been shown to really to stand out one hopefully you come to understand and believe the teachings that that are being propagated. If you disagree with the doctrines, that's a pretty strong mark against sticking to that church. The second thing is you need to become a part of a relatively small group that 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 can, considers that you're part of their family. I mean, look at the story of the disciples and what's going on there. People, I mean, they ate together, they did things together, they worshiped together. You need to feel a part of a group that, not a huge group that you don't know you know, 90% of you don't even know their names, but a, a relatively small group that knows you and you know them and they, you feel a part of them. That's number two. And number three, you need to get involved. 
you need to be doing something that's a part of the church ministry. I mean, it might, you might be a help out in the services of the church. You might be teaching a Sabbath school class. You might be doing a variety of things you can do, but you feel like people are expecting you to be there and to be involved. So those are the three things, and you have to have, interestingly enough, at least two of those three. You don't have to have all three, but you have to have at least two. I think friend, engendering a friendship mm -hmm. on a personal That's basis a major ties, ties into the middle mm -hmm. one you were talking about, and so often we mm -hmm. don't see too much of that or give it ourselves. But this friendship has to be the product of love, yes. not the yes. product of a responsibility that we submit oh, no. to because that's what we are as Christians. No, it has to be genuinely mm -hmm. a product of that love. Yeah. Well, we don't know how many people lived in the world in, <coughs> in the days of Jesus, the days of the apostles, but today we're dealing with seven <coughs> billion with a B. Seven billion people. How are we going to reach all those people? Well, in the days of Paul and the apostles, they had to travel by foot. Mm -hmm. And today, what do we have? Internet, Internet, radio, television, snail mail. We can still use some of that. All kinds of different means of transportation over long distances. I had someone came into my office today. I'm going to get on an airplane. This is an adult, uh, not a young adult. I'm going to fly on an airplane for the first time in my life. I'm going to fly from Ontario to San Diego. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure what to expect. I don't know. I think I'll be all right. <laughs> Get well, I've heard the approach in San Diego is kind of scary. Yeah, I, mean, I haven't done it myself. Yeah, it is. It's it right down. I, I can look at back on the same thing, and roughly the same distance in Australia, and it was in a DC-3. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I asked, and I was about one of four on it, it was a return flight, and I said to the hostess, any chance getting up front? And I go there, the captain's got a pipe he's smoking with his feet up on the instrument panel reading a paper paper and the other guy's doing something similar in the old tub she's just groaning along there <laughs> <laughs> never forgot it never well I can tell you what happened to me without going into all the details we were trying to fly out of New Guinea where we had spent some time uh, working as student missionaries and we all of a sudden we, we flew for, we, we got on the plane we flew to the next little spot and landed and a whole bunch of school children got on that were ready, going back to Australia for the next school year. And they were going up and down the aisle. And with them, make a long story short, they were a few pounds over their allowed a limit to take off from the airfield. And we were the only ones that didn't have to be on the absolute next plane. They kicked us off the plane. Yeah, yeah. Because they, they weren't, they, the, the field was long enough, no problem, but the, the, the extra extension they had just, just completed hadn't been certified yet. So they kicked us off. Yeah. At least you're here to tell us about it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, yes. Well, do you think, thinking about what they might have done in those days, do you think God still thinks, would ask us to go make house to house visits to spread the gospel? What do you think they actually did when they fanned out? Jim, I think you have something on that. Under the training of spirit. Excuse me. Under the training of Christ, the disciples had been led to feel their need of the Spirit. Under the Spirit's teaching, they had received the final qualification and went forth to do their life work. Ellen White, Acts to the Apostles, page 545.2. So you think there's any difference between under the training of Christ and under the Spirit's teaching? No. Or was the Spirit just carrying on the same message that Jesus had brought? That's the way it works. They came together. They confessed their faults to one another. Um, what do you think about when someone mentions the word church? Well, unfortunately, with at Tyndale's time, they thought of this institution. Mm -hmm. uh, Tyndale used the term congregation, which mm -hmm. relates back to synagogue, which means they're coming together. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one way of interpreting it anyway. Yeah. Ellen White had some words to say about the real church. Dennis, I think that would be you. Enfeebled 
and defective as it may appear, the church is the one object upon which God bestows in a special sense his supreme regard. It is the theater of his grace in which he delights to reveal his power to transform hearts. Acts of the Apostles 12, first paragraph. So what do you think? Do you think um, we'll, we, we'll sometimes face the, op the possibility of being persecuted by other church groups or by governments in our day? No doubt about it. Well, um, those who apparently, I guess, Carrie, you've got a comment there as we're running out of time. Those who at Pentecost were endued with power from on high were not thereby freed from further temptation and trial. And that came from Acts of the Apostles, page 49, paragraph 3. So the devil's still busy, isn't he? He was trying to do everything. But the people who accepted Jesus and the, the work of the Holy Spirit um, were ready. The cross became the dividing point between those who were Christians and those who were not. Those who rejected the cross were choosing eternal death. Those who accepted the cross were choosing eternal life. Fred, you have a comment on that. Yeah, and from Acts of the Apostles, page 48, the ambition of the believers was to reveal the likeness of Christ's character and to labor for the enlargement of his kingdom. Wow, amazing. As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we are more blessed with the truth and in more detail than any other group in history. Are we taking advantage of that? Dwayne? Follow the light you have. Set your heart to obey what you do know of the Word of God. His power, His very life, dwells in His Word. You are building on God's Word, and your character will be builded after the similitude of the character of Christ. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. Okay. Well, in our lesson, we've talked about a number of interesting experiences from those early days of the Christian church. Could some of those kind of things happen again? Could they happen to us? What stands between us, where we are as a church today, and this kind of an experience? Could we share our goods together? Could we develop a real family kind of relationship, welcoming people? What do our children think about the church? Are they, are they just attracted to what we do as a church? Do they feel a part of the family? We have some challenges. We all know God is waiting for us to step forward. Let's do it. Our kind and loving Father, as we look at these examples, these brief stories of those first few months, maybe, of the Christian church, we're envious. We wish we could have been a part of it. We wish we could see exactly what happened. But most of all, Lord, we wish that we could have the Holy Spirit to carry on that message and do as they did in our day so that your coming might be brought sooner to us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.